Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you all to SOAS this evening. I'm Helen McNaughton, a SOAS academic here and the acting chair of the Japan Research Center. This evening is a very special occasion. As you know, we are celebrating 100 years of Japanese studies and some 74 years since a distinct cohort known as the Dulwich Boys studied here during World War II. And you've just watched a video clip of Guy de Malbray, one of the Dulwich Boys, who sadly passed away last year. But we're very pleased to welcome his daughter, Amicia de, de, de Malbray, tonight. Welcome. Um, our panelists will be introduced to you soon, but our guest of honour this evening is Professor Ronald Dorr, a Dulwich boy himself, and many of you will know him as an eminent professor of Japanese studies. So um, we're delighted to welcome him, welcome him here to SOAS, but also congratulate him because today is his 91st birthday. Happy birthday. Thank oh. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to Professor Dorr, I extend a special welcome to others here in the audience, also of the generation who studied Japanese in the 1940s, and there are various family members here as well of, the, of that generation, including many members of Ronald Dorr's family. I also welcome staff from Dulwich College. The master and the head of history are here from Dulwich College. Um, tonight we are, of course, sharing a slice of history with that college. I would also like to mention the Bletchley Girls, uh, the family of Eileen Barker are here, um, and Eileen was one of seven members of WAF, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, who were recruited to learn intensive Japanese at studies at SOAS before being sent to Bletchley Park. It's important to mention the girls as well as the boys. <laughs> Tonight is about reflecting on and celebrating the long history of Japanese studies here at SOAS, as well as acknowledging its expansion and diversity over the decades. As many of you will know, the Japan Research Centre was founded back in 1978, and it now brings together some 30 academic and language staff from across the various SOAS departments, and of course welcomes research associates and Japanese studies students Sorry. as well. The fields of Japanese studies here at SOAS are wide-ranging, including language and linguistics, literature, film and media, history, anthropology and sociology, economics and management studies, politics, art history, religious studies and music. I believe this makes us the largest con concentration of Japanese studies specialists in the UK and the first to celebrate a centenary of Japanese studies. However, we of course do not work alone. We collaborate with our colleagues at other institutions, receive support from funding bodies, and we reach out into the community. I therefore also warmly welcome various supporters and partners of the JRC here this evening. Guests from the Embassy of Japan, the Japan Foundation, the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation, the Japan Society, the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation, academic colleagues from other U UK universities, and of course members of the London business community. And last but not least, I welcome both current SOAS staff and students, as well as SOAS alumni here this evening. And if I, may, if I may add a personal note, I myself am also a SOAS alumnus. Next month it will be 25 years since I um, arrived in London, rather nervously, from New Zealand. And on my first day here, my only friend in London at the time said to me, let's meet on the SOAS steps and take it from there. So I did. <laughs> I nervously waited on the SOAS steps, um, not even imagining at that time that I would later go on to do my master's here and to have a career in Japanese studies here as well. So it is this kind of past, current and indeed future interaction with SOAS that brings us all here together this evening. And I very much hope that you enjoy this celebration. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Valerie Amos, um, our SOAS director, who would like to say a few words as well. Over to Valerie. Uh, thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. And uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to SOAS this evening. Tonight marks the start of SOAS's centenary celebrations. And it's fitting that we begin our centenary with a celebration of the Dulwich Boys. I have to say that when I was told that I had to call you the Dulwich Boys, um, I was a little nervous because I thought, given your track record and wisdom, 
uh, it was uh, rather precipitate of me to do that. But it is part of the SOAS story, a very important part of the SOAS story, the Dulwich boys and the Bletchley girls. A real slice of SOAS history. Uh, tonight, again, as you've already heard, we also celebrate 100 years of Japanese study at SOAS. The Dulwich boys were instrumental in building UK-Japan relations after the Second World War, and they couldn't have done it if they didn't understand and appreciate the Japanese language and Japanese culture. And as we watch crises proliferate around the world and our increasingly interconnected world also becomes more fragmented, there has never been a more relevant time for SOAS. As the work of the Dulwich boys showed, building bridges across cultures is absolutely <coughs> key. So once again, welcome. A huge thank you to all of you for coming to SOAS this evening. And many thanks to our distinguished panelists and to Dulwich School for helping to organize tonight's event. Thank you all very much. I would now like to welcome the Ambassador of Japan to the UK. We're honored he's here this evening, Ambassador Hayashi, who's going to say a few words. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, <clears throat> good evening. I'm uh, really delighted to uh, celebrate with you uh, tonight uh, the long history, long history of Japanese studies at SOAS. Uh, uh, this unique institution marks its uh, centenary. So uh, uh, although the moderator said uh, I will give a few words, but my speech will also have to be a little long. <laughs> Japan and the UK began the modern relationship in the mid-19th uh, century. As a small number of young men from Choshu and Satsuma uh, became the first Japanese residents and students in London. Japan tried to trade with Great Britain, uh, the world's mightiest country at the time, and learn from it for its uh, modernization. And the bilateral relationship uh, steadily blossomed over the succeeding decades. In fact, in 1884, the size of the Japanese community in Britain was said to be 264. It was a very precise number. And it had increased <laughs> to more than 500 by 1910. On the other hand, it is estimated that more than half of the 4,700 Western residents in the 19, 1890s in Japan were British. Our ties were really flourishing and culminated in the Anglo-Japanese Alliance in 1902. Furthermore, the Japan Exposition in 1910 phenomenally boosted cultural interest in the small island nation in the Far East. It is in this context that SOAS was founded in 1916 at the School of Oriental Studies with the aim of training <coughs> colonial administrators and fostering knowledge of the Orient and Africa. Still, at the level of the general public, Japan and the UK remained remote from each other simply because they were geographically so separated and Japan was culturally so different in European eyes. The opening of the School of Oriental Study, Studies, as it was called, was therefore a highly significant event, enabling British people to engage through the method, method of area studies in the Japanese language and culture. Japanese was constantly taught from the outset of the uh, uh, teaching program uh, at SOAS uh, so in 1917. Uh, Japan's geopolitical profile on the world scene rose. Both the Army and the Royal Navy kept sending students for language training throughout the 1920s. With the tragic onset of World War II, the War Office, needing to produce translators and interpreters quickly, 
had no choice but to turn to SOAS and linked up with the school's Japanese studies section. State scholarships were offered to select school boys to train as military translators and intelligence officers. Thus emerged the distinguished group called the Dalich Boys. They were smart and highly educated. I just theory has it that uh, if you had already mastered languages such as Latin and Greek, uh, surely you could become proficient in a difficult language like Japanese. <laughs> well, for my part, uh, I wish that it worked the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if one can speak Japanese, then one can readily handle Latin or Greek. <laughs> but for me, at least, that had unfortunately been, not been the case. Some of these wartime language students were apparently assigned to study Japanese by sheer coincidence out of military need. For instance, Professor Ronald Dorr here, if I'm not mistake, uh, misinformed, was hoping to learn Chinese. <laughs> and the late Professor Louis Allen wanted to study Russian. Oh. Uh, I hope I, my information is correct. But from the wider and longer term perspective of our bilateral relationship, it was a fortunate coincidence indeed, since many of these bright minds became leading economists, politicians, diplomats, and professors <coughs> in the um, <coughs> post-war era. They were joined by those young, brave souls who uh, somehow had the courage and perhaps foresight to choose to take up the Japanese language soon after Japan had been reduced to almost nothing but ashes. This group Japan specialists together rebuilt the bridges of friendship between our two countries after the war. One of the towering figures of the group, uh, Sir Hugh Kotachi, who is just over there, um, a former ambassador to Japan, once uh, declared, quote, my ultimate wish for Japan was that it would be firmly integrated in international society, end quote. I know that based on his deep affection toward Japan, Sahu has always been a teacher to Japan who gives away marks rather sparingly. <laughs> but... As Japanese ambassador, I would argue that his wish had been largely fulfilled as Japan, now firmly committed to peace, democracy, and democratic principles, is constantly seeking a greater and more fitting role in the international community to uh, contribute to the peace and prosperity of the world. No wonder the UK's Strategic Defense and Security Review 2015, issued last autumn, broke new ground by officially declaring Japan to be among the UK's allies and its closest security partner in Asia. Not just in the Asia Pacific regions, but from the Middle East to Africa, Japan is willing to shoulder greater responsibility. As you will see in the Syria conference this week, uh, to be held in London, in the G7 summit uh, meeting in May, in Japan, and the TICAD 6 African Development Summit this summer to be held in Kenya, as well as on the UN Security Council. And, and in the process, you will witness visible signs of Japan-UK cooperation and coordination everywhere. We owe so much to those Japan hands, including Dalich boys who helped bring our bilateral relationship from its post-war nadir to the heights of today. SOAS, including the Japan Research Center, founded in 1978, which is kindly hosting this landmark event tonight, has developed as undoubtedly one of the world's leading educational institute, institutions in its specialized field. We appreciate not just its distinguished academic uh, uh, record, but also its future-oriented links 
with primary and secondary schools in teaching Japanese. Indeed, it remains an invaluable center for nurturing interest in Japan, its culture, and language in the UK. As we look back on 100 years of its tremendous achievements, notably in furthering understanding of and friendship with Japan, may I wish SOAS yet more success over the coming century and beyond. Thank you and many congratulations. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hayashi and Valerie, for the introductions. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Nick Hyam. Uh, Nick, who many of you will know as a journalist and most notably as a correspondent for BBC News. And Nick wrote a piece on the Dulwich Boys and SOAS last year for the BBC and subsequently was strong-armed into uh, chairing our panel this evening. So I'm delighted to now hand over to uh, proceedings over to Nick and he's going to run the rest of the session. Helen, thank you very much indeed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you will note from Helen's uh, introduction that um, one thing I lack conspicuously, apart from having written that article and an accompanying feature on the Today programme on Radio 4 last summer, is any knowledge of Japan or Japanese. <laughs> I have never visited the country and I cannot speak the language. Uh, the great Nicholas Tomlin, a wonderful uh, British journalist once said that all a journalist needs is rat-like cunning and a plausible manner. So tonight I propose to see if that's true. Um, you heard from the ambassador a bit about uh, the history of SOAS and the Dulwich Boys and Japanese te teaching here. We're going to celebrate that tonight, I hope, but also subject SOAS's record to a little critical scrutiny and look at what the future might hold. And to do that, we have an immensely distinguished panel, some of whom have already been introduced to you. Uh, Ron Dorr on the far end, Professor... Uh, of sociology jointly at SOAS and the London School of Economics in the 1960s, a man who has written many books on Japan, an acknowledged expert in his field, and a man who, as you have heard, got his first taste of Japanese as a bright schoolboy in 1942 here at SOAS and boarding at Dulwich College. Next to him, Sir Hugh Cortazzi, a former UK diplomat who enjoyed four postings to Tokyo, the last as ambassador for four years in the 1980s. He too was a wartime student at SOAS, though he came slightly later as a serviceman to learn Japanese on a joint services course in September 1943. And I believe you were taught by Ron Dorr. Is that true? You were. You were, because Ron Dorr, having completed his course, was drafted into the army, and along with the rest of the, the Dulwich boys, and then had an accident in basic training, I believe. <laughs> was invalided out. Very clumsy <laughs> <laughs> so he was invalided out, brought back onto the teaching staff at uh, SOAS, and we'll discuss perhaps briefly why that was necessary uh, a little bit later. Uh, Hugh Cortazzi has also written many books about Japan, worked as an advisor to British companies and Japanese companies. Next to him, uh, a diplomat of a, a rather more recent vintage, Martin Hatful, uh, who came to SOAS for the first year of a Foreign Office language course in 1981, I think, um, and was twice posted to Tokyo, the second time as number two in the embassy between 2003 and 2008. He later became ambassador to Indonesia. He's now director of international public affairs for the drinks company Diageo, and he is also an old boy of Dulwich College, I understand. Uh, Caroline Bennett went to Japan on her gap year in 1985 and liked it so much she stayed for two years and then came back to London to SOAS to study for a degree in Japanese and economics. We'll discuss the significance of that a bit later as well. She went to work in the city and while uh, there she founded the, the UK's first, uh, uh, forgive me, I'm not sure how this is pronounced. I, Kaiten, the first Kaiten sushi bar in the UK. It's called Moshi Moshi. Yo Sushi Eat Your Heart Out. Moshi Moshi got there first. That was back in 1994. At one stage there were seven Moshi Moshis, but now we're, you're back to one, the original one. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, still the owner. Next to her, Branwyn Darlington, uh, born and raised in Berkeley, California, studied Japanese at college, went to Japan as an English teacher, back to the United States to teach Japanese, came to SOAS in 2004 to do a master's in international management for Japan. She now works in London for a Japanese food importer and distributor called Haro, whose customers include Moshi Moshi. Not sure Caroline knew that until tonight. <laughs> And finally, Professor Laura Hine, who is a SOAS Centenary Fellow. Uh, in her day job, she's a professor at Northwestern University in Illinois in the history department there. Uh, she began studying Japan because you were frustrated with the Western-centric view of everybody else and thought it would be interesting to study a country which was rather different. Um, she's published widely on Japanese politics, Japanese economy, Japan's attitude to its past. During her time at SOAS, she is completing a study of Japanese efforts after 1945 to extricate themselves from what they saw as fascism. Um, you've heard a bit of brief history. Let me just say that there were actually two institutions in Britain in 1942 after Pearl Harbor and the Japanese invasion of the Dutch and British uh, colonies in Southeast Asia who set up Japanese teaching uh, regimes. One was Bletchley Park, but we didn't hear about that for many, many years because everything that happened at Bletchley Park was secret. The other was here at SOAS. Um, SOAS had been teaching Japanese since 1917, but um, with only a relatively small throughput of students. There were just two people who took degrees in Japanese in the interwar years, one in 1938 and one in 1939. Um, at the late 1930s, the number of people studying Japanese at SOAS was actually declining. In 1939, 1940, there were just four full-time students of Japanese here and two occasional students, a total of six. And then came Pearl Harbor, then came the fall of Singapore. Many of the people in Britain who had learned to speak Japanese had perforce been in the Far East and were in Japanese captivity. So something had to be done and it had to be done very quickly. And I get the impression, Ron Dorr, that the course which you came on, you and the other Dulwich boys, was a rather makeshift affair. The teaching materials uh, had to be gathered together from a very poor base. The teachers were a pretty diverse bunch. Um, and given that, how well do you think you were taught? Um, I think we were taught really rather well. Uh, you see, uh, the organiser of the course, uh, Frank Daniels, uh, was a very meticulous uh, scholar who uh, was uh, with with a, a, a great linguistic sense, uh, and he was very good at uh, analysing how idioms came to be idioms, and uh, at uh, giving us a sense not only of the language itself, but also of the mentality, of the culture that lay behind so many of the idioms that the language used. Uh, and that meant that we had no, uh, a not terribly well planned, <laughs> but nevertheless very effective uh, form of teaching for these uh, two years. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that um, many of you on that course, and indeed people like Hugh Cortazzi on subsequent courses during the war, later became experts on Japan, students of Japan, um, important people in Anglo-Japanese relations or the understanding of Japan. And I find that surprising because you were the, learning the language of the enemy in the middle of a war, and yet you seem to have acquired, as a result of this course, a remarkable respect for Japan and Japanese culture. How, how come? Yes. <laughs> well, the, the answer to that is easy. We were taught by women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nearly all our teachers were the wives of, uh, of 
Englishman who'd married in Japan in the war. And uh, although they were not uh, necessary, uh, although they, their mission was to stick to teaching us Japanese, which they did quite efficiently, because they were very intelligent and very good at analysing the origins of idioms and things of that kind. But at the same time, they were people who were proud of their own culture and uh, they were also uh, extremely self-confident uh, and uh, it was, as it were, by osmosis that they transferred to us the respect that they had for themselves and for the culture in which they'd been brought up. Uh, and that was very good for us. And that, that meant that uh, beyond a linguistic capacity, we also acquired a certain empathy for, 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 the Jap for, for, for Japanese people and for the culture that had, to, that had formed them. Uh, Hugh Cortancy, you came um, uh, to a, on a later course, um, one of a number of courses run for servicemen, um, and you, th they, were, they were short courses, just six months, I think, and they were designated as either for interpreters or translators. What did that mean? Um, they weren't six-month courses. They were a year to 18 months. Um, they, uh, the interpreters were supposed to concentrate solely on the, or, or almost entirely on spoken language, the translators on the written language. Um, it was quite, became quite clear to us, uh, some of us young men in the services at the time that really this was a false distinction. You could not really speak Japanese without knowing something of the written language. You could not, and you certainly couldn't interrogate uh, and, and do so properly. And if you were a translator, you had to be able to understand the spoken language too. So gradually, we, I think we and the, the staff uh, got, in a sense, got together and, and agreed that the changes had to be made. Um, they were help, we were helped by, obviously, the people like Professor Eve Edwards, who was the director of the, of the school at the time, and the, 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 the enemy, if you like it, as far as we were concerned, were the, the service uh, bigwigs in, um, who, who simply said, we want people who can speak Japanese, we want people who can translate Japanese. We don't waste, it, waste any time. Right. Of, of course, it was also quite clear um, to, to all of us, anyone to, to an intelligent person, that in order to um, speak and understand, read or translate, you had to learn something about the culture. And so we tried our best, perhaps, with, uh, we had some, some interesting t uh, lectures which were given, for instance, by Sir, the, uh, Sir John Pilcher, who got everybody r laughing down the, in, in he, with his wit and his pictures of, uh, of Kabuki. Um, and we got our, in, onto books. So we did begin, I, I can only say begin, to understand that to, we had to study the cultural and the historical background. Can I ask you about the teaching staff? Um, uh, Ron has referred to the fact that there, were, there was more than one woman, including Frank Daniel's wife, Otome, I think, who was one of the, the teachers. But um, there was a pretty motley collection. Pat O'Neill, who was uh, another member of the Dulwich Boys and who later became professor of Japanese here at SOAS, wrote a memoir in which he talked about um, the teachers, including a former military attaché in Tokyo, a chap called General Sir Francis Pigott, a couple of Japanese foreign correspondents who'd been in Britain at the start of the war, um, some Japanese second generation <laughs> Japanese military Canadian sergeants. Um, did, you, did you think that you were well taught? I think, uh, sorry. sorry, I think that in, as far as we, I was concerned, we were taught as well as, as was possible at that time, bearing in mind that there was, they had no uh, materials on which to start. They had to, I mean, texts had to be prepared, um, vocabularies worked out. And so I think we, uh, the, the hot, the the motley crew, if you like it, of teachers were a really a conscientious and 
did their best with what they had. Pat, Pat O'Neill, uh, in a memoir, wrote that one of the texts they had was a, copied from a children's magazine, and it was a story about a group of schoolgirls being shown around a whaling ship. He wrote, the Japanese for flinching knife was therefore part of our earliest Japanese vocabulary. <laughs> Many years later, he claims to have met someone in Japan who'd been on a service course at SOAS and would, with the slightest encouragement, recite the whole of the first section of the story in Japanese <laughs> as a party piece. Um, <laughs> I, I said, Hugh, that um, the products of the wartime courses at SOAS were very influential in uh, Anglo-Japanese relations after the war. Um, and there are one or two quite high-profile people, including yourself and Ron Dorr. Um, but am I, am, I, am I right in that? I mean, uh, can, we, can we think of, of, of a lot of people who were influential, or was it actually quite a small number? I think there were a, quite a large number who went into academia who... Achieved. I'm from Charles Dunn and Pat O'Neill um, here, uh, just two, two names. And then, of course, on my own contemporaries, Ken Gardner, uh, who went to the, with the librarianship, um, and, and other, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one other person I should mention is Louis Allen, who went to, to Durham and who wrote uh, uh, one of the most important books on, on the Burma War. Uh, outside the academia, I think particularly of my old friend Sir Peter Parker, who um, was uh, a member, was a Dulwich boy, and who uh, became, as you know, um, uh, chairman of British Rail at one stage. He was a prominent businessman. He was the chairman of the uh, Band Festival in Britain in 1991, and he was a, a, an enthusiast, uh, particularly of the haiku. W whenever he gave a speech, it was always started with or ended with a haiku. He, no, he was a particular, a particular case of someone outside who... Yes, he was... Outside the academia who achieved success. He was also clearly um, uh, earmarked by his contemporaries on the course as, as um, the, the, the member of the course most likely to succeed. Not everybody liked him, though. Guida Mowbray, who you saw in the video at the beginning, didn't much care for Peter Parker, who he called him thoroughly irritating, sanctimonious and self-important. But everybody else... I don't agree. <laughs> I didn't. I assumed you wouldn't. I assumed you wouldn't. Can I? One other question. You, uh, when you left SOAS, you went to the Far East with the services, and later to occupied Japan. How did you put what you had learnt here into practice? How 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 useful was it? Well, I think it was essential for what I was was supposed to be doing. I was, after all, involved in intelligence work, both in the, uh, in first of all in India. And then I was in, in Singapore at the time of the Japanese surrender and worked in, in Singapore and Malaya on um, historical matters, the history of, of the Japanese air, air power in, in, uh, during the war, for instance. And then I particularly wanted to get to Japan and I eventually managed to wangle, if you like it, a, a posting to British Commonwealth uh, forces in uh, the RAF in Iwakuni, and I was in Iwakuni for about six months and another um, nine months in Yonago. So that there I used my Japanese all the time. It was essential, um, as, as I think another person who was an ex sos person, Professor uh, Ian Nish, who also used his uh, Japanese to advantage, I think, in the occupation. Uh, Martin Hatfield, can I, I turn to you? You came to SOAS on a Foreign Office language course, as we said, in 1981. Um, I'm not quite sure how the selection for Foreign Office language courses works. Do they say, Hatful, you're going to do Japanese, or do you say, I'd like to do Japanese, please? And if it's the latter, why Japanese? Uh, the, uh, the way it worked then, it's changed uh, now several times along the way, I think, but the way it worked then was that um, everyone who joined the Foreign Office uh, within the first few months took a quote, hard language aptitude test, unquote. And depending on how well you scored, or badly, um, you were invited then to choose, or to express a preference, never to choose, to express a preference <laughs> for uh, the, uh, 
one of the range of languages that foreign office was going to be training people in. They had quite a sort of um, uh, five-year or ten-year program approach to language training in those days. So they would say that, OK, this year we need X number of Japanese to train X number of Japanese speakers and Chinese speakers and so on. And from that list, um, I did uh, do reasonably well on the test. And so um, Japanese was one of the ones I could choose. I chose it really for a mix of reasons, never having had anything to do with Japan before. Um, uh, partly because um, I wanted to go somewhere which I felt would be of continuing interest and stimulation throughout my foreign office career. Um, and Japan certainly filled that bill. And also because I was already married at that stage and I wanted to go somewhere where I was confident that my wife would be able to work if she chose and to uh, pursue her own career as a teacher if she chose. And so that actually limited it quite a bit because um, there were quite a few others there where that wouldn't be the, the case. And so I chose Japanese and never regretted it. And you, uh, the, the course you went on was a very conventional language course. It was an intensive language course here at SAS. Yes, I mean, it was, it was tailor-made. Um, it was, at that time, uh, the Foreign Office um, commissioned SOAS to do all of its, pretty much all of its hard language training. So I was training not only with my Japanese um, student compatriots, but um, also others doing Arabic or Chinese or um, Urdu or Korean or whatever. Um, and, you know, the, the Foreign Office um, uh, presumably stipulated the uh, requirements for the course. But yes, we, we went through um, a year of, of pretty um, intensive, basic, you know, from scratch training in Japanese. Does that mean there wasn't much um, concentration on Japanese culture, Japanese uh, economy, Japanese politics, anything of that sort? Um, not formally as part of the course, but because we were here, and one of the great advantages of, of, of pursuing the language course at SOAS, there, were, there was always the opportunity to attend lectures um, in other aspects of Japanese culture, history, and, and so on, which uh, you know, we, we, we took the opportunity to do when we could. How did you find Japan when you went in the mid, uh, early to mid-1980s? Um, describe the kind of society that you, you encountered. And, and your, particularly your impressions of it? Um, it was, I mean, for me, it was the first time I'd been to Japan. It was uh, completely um, uh, unlike anything that I had experienced before. I travelled quite widely in Europe at that stage, but not um, uh, anywhere in, in Asia. And I think what really struck me, having sort of landed in, uh, in Tokyo um, and uh, my second day in Tokyo, I think we had one of the most violent typhoons of the period of, of about five years or so, one of the strongest typhoons, so you're immediately um, aware of, of some of the natural forces which actually shape people, the way that people think and, and, and the way that um, the culture has evolved in Japan. But the fantastic contrast between Tokyo and um, where I went uh, within a few days of arriving in Japan, which was to go and spend, do a homestay uh, in uh, Yamaguchi Prefecture, in Yamaguchi, uh, right down in the in the far west of Honshu, um, in a a very rural environment. So it was the extraordinary sort of contrast, I think, between metropolitan Tokyo and and rural Yamaguchi, which was one of the things that I remember most clearly. I'm working through the panel in chronological order because the next to attend SOAS was Caroline Bennett. You came here in uh, remind me what the date was 1985. Uh, 89. 89. Yeah. Um, having first gone to Japan in 85, mm -hmm. what, again, what was the appeal or the attraction of Japan for you? Um, initially, I have to say, I don't think I could have even put Japan on a map. That's how ignorant I was of, of Japan. I went there straight after school, um, and it was one of those flips in life where you could have been on a kibbutz in Israel or grape picking in France or VSO work in India. And mm. Japan just happened to respond to my request to be there, probably before the letter had even arrived in, in India. Um, so I ended up in Japan. And, you know, that was such a pivotal moment in, in my life. And I'll, I'll never look back. I've got so much to thank for Japan to open me up to so many things. And so you were going to be a, a bio biologist, a I biochemist? I was studied biochemistry, and I, I realised after a year of being in Japan that I hadn't looked at one scientific journal since I'd <laughs> been there. I thought, well, perhaps now is a good time to change course. So yeah. the significance, it seems to me, uh, of uh, your experience as a, a degree student at, at SOAS was that you did a combined degree, Japanese in economics, um, and... 
the one of the significant developments in the post-war years at SOAS, as in elsewhere, as where in Japanese studies, has been this broadening of the definition to, in, to a, a, a incorporate a kind of multidisciplinary uh, approach uh, with people in other disciplines who are expert in Japan and who will, will teach. How did that work for you? Was it a success? I, I mean, it, it was absolutely fantastic that SOAS offered that. I think there was only one other university that did offer that ability to study outside of that. So the, the, the ability to look at two different um, fields of study completely enriched my time whilst I was here and left me with far greater opportunities, I think, when you graduate to look at different aspects of what you want, might want to do. Um, so yes, I really enjoyed the economics here, both the Japanese economics, but also just the pure economics that I studied, mostly through UCL, but sometimes also through, mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. SOAS. And I know if I were here now, I would be looking at the food anthropology department with great interest <laughs> um, and be sort of sneaking off to lectures there. Any so Japanese specialists in the food anthropology department here at SOAS? They've had, certainly had some good lectures on the Japanese um, food <laughs> aspects. Right. Um, we'll come back to um, uh, th that, uh, uh, this, this issue of multi the multidisciplinary approach to, to Japanese studies. How useful did you find it in reality? It was fun to study. Did it help you get a job? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my economics professor here got me my first job, pretty much. I mean, he introduced me to people that he'd met, and, and I went for interviews, and, and that was it. So I think at the time, um, Japan's economy was so strong, there were very few Japanese speakers, um, and they were, they were actively looking for Japanese speakers and people with an understanding of the culture as well, I suppose, to be able to tackle the financial markets in Japan. So absolute perfect timing. I mean, being born in the in the year of the fire horse, which apparently is very, very un, um, g generally not one that won't be proud of, um, actually served me very well. So yeah, I was quite happy with that. And you currently run, as we were saying, a business, uh, a, a Japanese themed business, if that's not to um, uh, talk it down too much. Um, a Japanese, how Japanese is your business? Uh, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're eminently English, I can tell that. I am the only English person in my company. Um, that, does, that, does that help? Uh, we, have, we have about five Japanese nationals. It's become increasingly difficult to hire them. I mean, the, 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 the visa restrictions have become such that it's, it's virtually impossible now. So the few that I have have all been on long-term visas. They've all been here for many years. And I have five members of the team that have been with me back since 1994, none of whom are Japanese, sadly. They're Korean, uh, sorry, uh, Chinese and <coughs> Filipino. Um, but I, I like to think that of the options out there, we are peculiarly Japanese, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I will take your word for it. Branwyn, Branwyn Darlington, um, you came here probably 10 years after um, uh, uh, Caroline when the Japanese economy was in a very different place. You came to study uh, a master's, one year master's in uh, Japanese business. Give me Interna international management for Japan. International management for Japan. Um, why, why that? Why choose that? Well, I started thinking about it actually. Um, after we spoke the other day, um, I had actually sort of been stalking SOAS a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in Japan on the JET program, one of my good friends, um, Finnish JET, came back here and came straight to SOAS to do a Japanese linguistics master's. Um, and that was actually the first time I'd ever heard of SOAS. Um, growing up in the States, I hadn't really heard much. I hadn't really ever considered living here. I'd always wanted to. Um, but she's came, she started talking about SOAS and the Japanese language program and the linguistics program. And I thought, that sounds interesting, but I'm not sure that I really, really want to get into teaching Japanese, even though I actually did. Um, and so I kept looking sort of year on year to see what other programs there were. And sort of serendipitously, I opened a sort of pamphlet and it said, we've got this international management um, for Japan part of, at the time it was called CFIMS, the Center for, what is it, Finance Management and Finance and Management. Now it's DFIM's Department of. Um, and I saw that. And, I, and for the first time, I was actually really interested in a management degree that wasn't completely business and economics minded, that was more cross-cultural, um, talking about cross-cultural management, cross-cultural um, HR, um, human resources, et cetera. And having, I, I guess I'm one of the few people on this panel who didn't really study Japanese language at SOAS at all. Um, didn't have any Japanese language except for just 
internally with friends. So it was a real selling point for you. But that for you me, could... the idea that I could do sort of a management degree um, and incorporate my Japanese and use that as sort of a stepping stone to maybe um, a career path that might incorporate all the Japan um, that I had that wouldn't necessarily just be teaching or just be language oriented was very appealing. And you were also saying to me when we spoke on the phone that the fact that SOAS was in London was a significant selling point. That really did help, yes. Because at the point when I was looking, I, I had friends who were still in Japan, I had friends who were here, and I was just the one sad little person stuck in California. <laughs> and I thought, well, OK, London is halfway in between Tokyo and, um, and San Francisco. <laughs> Go that way. Um, and so here I am. So I was able to incorporate all of my sort of interests in one. And you now work for this uh, company. Uh, you're, you're a manager at Haro, which is a food importer and a, a Japanese food importer and distributor. Um, can I ask you the same question that I asked Caroline? How Japanese is that company? It's a very interesting company in that the sales team is very, very Japanese. Mm. Um, the management is very Japanese. Um, but the other departments are a mix of different cultures, different languages. Um, and I actually, right now, um, in what I do, I don't use my Japanese very much at all um, for work. But I speak to my colleagues. Um, but SOAS definitely helped me get that and helped me get the management track um, versus being, I don't know, one of our customer service reps or something else. Did you ever consider, you worked in, in Japan as, a, as an English language teacher, as you said, did you ever consider going back to Japan to work? Oh, I always wanted to, yeah. I, I never wanted to leave Japan, really. I was really homesick for Japan when I went back to California the first time. Um, but I found at the time... Um, it was very difficult to get a work permit to do anything. Um, it was also, I felt, either you could teach English and just forever be an English teacher, or you could get into sort of business and finance, and I didn't have enough experience in those areas at the time. It was another reason why the SOAS degree was really appealing. And was your timing poor in that the Japanese economic bubble had burst, the J Japanese economy? That economy may was... not have helped particularly, but... It's not like Japan fell off the face of the planet. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, Laura Hine, um, you uh, have come to uh, uh, SOAS from, as we said, Northwestern. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your impressions of the place. Why, why did you want to come to SOAS? Now that you're here, what do you think its strengths and weaknesses are? in terms of, of Japanese studies. Well, let me start by saying how envious I am to hear how much you all liked your Japanese language training, <laughs> which was, um, I did not enjoy mine in the United States. I, I, I think, in general, Japanese language training is so much better than it used to be. And uh, my students enjoy learning it. Um, so that would be the first thing, is that obviously you pioneered that here. Um, and I think it has really spread um, to be more typical of, uh, experience today. But um, you know, when I did it in the 1980s, I was um, funded, and I just treated it like my job, not a very nice job. And it was all the other things that I liked a whole lot more. Um, so my university also has a very strong African studies program, and so I've been aware of SOAS as a place that um, truly brings information about the part of the world that m most people in my world don't know very well. Um, so I've always admired that about it and uh, from afar, and it certainly lives up to that. I just find it astonishing and fascinating just to listen to the conversations going on around me because people are so engaged uh, with so many important issues of the day. Um, it's an impressive place. <laughs> we, we would, let me uh, ask you as an historian, we were talking earlier, particularly with Hugh Cortancy, about the uh, importance of SOAS wartime graduates in the post-war mm -hmm. uh, recovery of Japan and Anglo-Japanese relations. Now, your current work is about Japan post-1945. Um, were people from SOAS influential in Japan? And if so, how? 
well, I, you've already been hearing about it, but I think actually the things that Valerie Amos was saying are very similar to what I was thinking. It's hard to go from foe to friend. The kinds of passions that get worked up during the war are hard to set aside. When I started studying Japan in the early 1980s, the single most common question I got asked was, why were the Japanese so brutal in World War II? Um, and that was, you know, I had, I had to come up with an answer <laughs> because I got asked it all the time. This is no longer what everyone asks when you hear about Japan. At the, after that, the most common question was, how did the economy grow so fast? And now I would say there's a huge variety of things, although the single most common one has something to do with manga and anime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and clearly, the people who have come through SOAS have been a huge part of that for Great Britain, for Europe, and for the world. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, uh, Peter Kornitsky from Cambridge very helpfully sent me a, a draft history of Japanese studies in the UK that he's, he's written uh, for a book that he and Hugh Cortazia are um, editing jointly. Um, and the kind of overarching development in that is the the way in which Japanese studies in, in the UK, uh, in institutes of higher learning, has moved from language teaching, essentially, purely and simply, into a much broader range of disciplines, and there are now Japanese experts in a whole lot of different subject areas, finance, politics, economics, culture of all sorts. Um, Ron Dor, I suppose you were one of the first specialists, J Japanese specialists in a department other than a Japanese department. You are, by, by profession, a sociologist. Do you welcome, did you welcome when it was happening, this move, uh, this expansion of Japanese studies to incorporate a great many more disciplines? And do you think it has gone as far as it can, or do you think it should go further? I think it could certainly go further. Um, I, I mean, you're talking about now. Yes. Yes. Um, I think, yes, courses can help. But in our case, uh, insofar as we got more than language, it wasn't a matter of having courses. It was because we were... Uh, a bunch of male pubescent <laughs> teenagers, um, and we were taught entirely by Japanese women. <laughs> and there was a certain, as it were, uh, rapport uh, created uh, as a result of that. And uh, you see, the Japanese women who taught us, uh, although they were... Uh, representatives of the enemy. They were people who were exceeding, I mean, not only exceedingly intelligent and very good at explaining the intricacies of the language, but they were also people who had been brought up in Japanese culture and were very proud of their culture. And uh, it was more by osmosis, by this kind of uh, uh, natural uh, regard natural attraction that uh, we acquired something much more than a linguistic competence. We acquired something like a respect and uh, uh, an interest in Japanese culture uh, simply because of that, uh, of the fact that we were taught by women. Okay. Uh, well, we, I should perhaps say that um, we've mentioned one of the women who taught Ron, who was Otome Daniels. The other um, was, I think, a lady called Aiko Clark, with whom all the people on the um, SOAS wartime courses seem to have fallen in love. Um, uh, can, can, I, can, I, can I ask you, um, though, looking at the situation in, in, in recent years, the last 20 or 30 years, do you think that the... Uh, approach that not just SOAS but other universities have taken to broadening Japanese studies has been the right one? Sorry? 
Well, yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, there's been a... Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, uh, there was a, a newly developed sense that the teaching of uh, languages in universities had a lot to do with the uh, relationships, the strategic and economic relationships uh, that uh, underpinned the, uh, the language courses. Uh, and there was a, a, this gradual appreciation, which in our case was uh, more or less accidental, due to the fact that we were taught by women. So. But uh, uh, that uh, was developed uh, uh, intensively and purposefully after the war, with the, the, with the broadening of courses uh, and uh, the addition of uh, uh, language, not, not only language tests, uh, but tests of cultural understanding. Hmm. Hugh Kotatsi, do you think we've got the mix right in our academic study of Japan? On the whole, I think we've got the, the mix right, but there is still um, a number of gaps that need to be filled in relation to our understanding of modern Japan, especially in, in areas of e economics and trade, which have economics and trade, after all, have been the dominant factor in our relationship in the last uh, half century, uh, I think we, we have s perhaps not studied these, these uh, sufficiently. There are, uh, we are, one of the most important issues for Britain has been Japanese investment, which has been a, a major factor in the industrial revival. Uh, and I found very few studies have been made of those investments. And we have no studies of British investments in Japan, uh, which all, are all no, very important all. from the point of view of, of Japanese point of view and British point of view. Ma Martin Hatfield, um, I suppose one possible explanation, if Hugh Cortazzi is right, is that the, the change in economic circumstances in Japan rather depressed Japanese studies. Uh, and if you look at the Kornitsky history, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. There have been periodic uh, increases in teaching capacity and money available for Japanese studies courses, and then there's been a gradual kind of falling back. Is, is, do, do you think that's a, a, a problem? Uh, I think it probably is, is the case uh, that, in a sense, de demand reflects the perception of Japan's role in the world, and it, that if you, uh, if you are uh, someone thinking of uh, studying a foreign language and committing, you know, what's going to be a significant chunk of your of your uh, academic career to uh, studying that language, then you're thinking about how you're going to use it in the future. And apart from the relatively small number of people who might choose to to, to make it an academic specialisation, people will be thinking about, you know, how how am I going to be able to to make use of this skill which I'm I'm fascinated to learn, but is it going to have a practical application? And when I certainly when I when I was doing my Japanese uh, studies, it was um, at a period when the Japan's economy was extremely strong. It was Japan as number one, and uh, the uh, but Japan was also uh, you know recognised as a one of the key powers in the G7 and and all the rest of it. So in terms of uh, the, the global strategic picture as well, Japan's importance was unquestioned. I think um, the the. Uh, what's happened in China over the intervening period has clearly changed this sort of equation. If you're thinking about where does the balance of interest lie in terms of, of your uh, the, the the kind of academic interest in East Asia in in the UK, but I think it uh, th that change in international circumstances and global circumstances actually means that it's more relevant. Uh, the, the kind of uh, um, diversification of Japanese studies is more relevant because it's about um, seeing Japan in the context of the changing global environment and the continuing importance that Japan has, which I absolutely believe in, the continuing importance it has for the UK, but it's in a different global context. And I think, therefore, uh, maybe we need to continue to be innovative in how we approach Japanese studies in that sense. Laura Hine, do you think there are blind spots in our study of Japan? What are they? I, 
uh, was listening with great interest to what Martin Hatfell was just saying because I really agree with that. Um, I do think that it's uh, not, I think it's a mistake to say that there is an inverse relationship between study of China and study of Japan. It's really, Ch Japan is the kind of society that J China would like to become still <laughs> and is still striving towards. And um, because my students are now so much more interested in culture and a broad range of things, uh, it's more in the way that they're interested in France or Italy. And um, I think it makes a lot more sense often to be thinking about Japan in that context as opposed to some kind of East Asia ghetto. I, I mean, there are other issues, and of course, the physical proximity of the two countries really matters. But I think that's kind of a hangover from when studying both China and Japan was exotic, and it's time to stop thinking that way. Um, I would also agree that social sciences are still weaker on Japan than they should be um, uh, in the United States, uh, for sure. Okay, I'm going to throw this open to the, um, r the body of the Kirk for uh, what's left of our time. I'm going to pinpoint two people, though, just to get their reactions to what they've heard. They're both conveniently sitting in the front row right in front of me, um, and we have a microphone. If we could have it down here. Um, uh, Peter Kornitsky, you are a professor at Cambridge, and you sent me that very helpful history. Um, and... Um, you, um, you use a term in that, uh, which I don't think I've heard before. It's not a very um, uh, uh, attractive term, but I understand why you use it. You talk about the de-eurocentrization of studies um, across, across the board, and, 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 uh, across all the disciplines. Um, you clearly think that's a good thing and we need more of it. Yes. First of all, I'm ex-Cambridge, and I'm very proud to be a professorial research associate here at SOAS. I, uh, I, I beg your and Cambridge's, and indeed SOAS. And I need to say that because my wife teaches at SOAS. <laughs> um, yes, that is a very ugly word, um, and it's one word that really doesn't apply to SOAS, because if there's one university in the UK uh, which doesn't need to be told to stop being Eurocentric, it's SOAS. Um, but that doesn't really apply to a lot of other universities, and it, it certainly didn't 20 or 30 years ago. And what is important, it seems to me, is for the study of Japan or China or other parts of the world to become part of the normal study of disciplines such as society, such as uh, anthropology, such as the economy, <coughs> um, music, art history. And it's taken a long time, and that process still isn't complete. Um, there are many departments of uh, art history in the UK, for example, where nothing is taught that's not on, on Western Europe. But um, Oxford now has Oxford a professor. Oxford now has a professor who is a, a specialist in Chinese art. That's true. Um, that's the first step and a very significant step. But there are a lot more steps like that still to be made. Um, I ask you to pass the microphone on to Andrew Gersel next to you, Professor of Japanese Studies at SOAS. Have I got that right? <laughs> yes, good. Um, what do you think of what you've heard? I mean, people have, have had some very warm words to say about SOAS. Do you think there are areas in which you might do better? Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Um, I've had the experience this past year uh, with Hyoko Tatsi and Peter Kornitsky's uh, volume on Japanese studies in the UK to look to, to do one for SOAS. And one of the things that um, surprised me, of course, was how much there was and how much there's continuing is. But the other thing that surprised me was how much of a struggle it has been to and continues to be to have, j this was Japanese studies, but it's true for all of SOAS kinds of subjects, it's, it's dependent on government reports, government reviews, outside funding to a certain extent. Even if there are student num the, the student numbers have tended, they're pretty good, but it's not compared to the big subjects and, or the research assessment exercises. The smaller fields we have, it's difficult for them to be reviewed in the same way and come out looking good compared to other sorts of subjects. So it's really a struggle we're celebrating today but one of the things that I was really surprised, the last hundred years really has been a struggle. And it's, if anything, it's likely to be even more difficult the way that universities are funded. 
So the, the depend, depending particularly on you, student numbers, the SOAS in general has a, a, t a tough time, but also having to teach language as a core part of that is, is a relatively expensive one. So the plea that realistically we will need more outside funding to, to actually in make sure that things continue, whether it be in study of Japanese politics and economics or traditional older <coughs> subjects. And in fact, the most threatened <coughs> subjects are anything before a study of, of uh, before the 20th century, if anything. There's been a, that's been more of a, of a, of a decrease. P Peter concludes his essay by saying the loss of earmarked funding and the end of special treatment has made departments of Japanese studies vulnerable to the calculus of student numbers and the rhetoric of value for money and the demands of the market. I'm sure there are academics in many other disciplines who would make a similar uh, observation, but y you think it's particularly bad for uh, Japanese studies, the two of you? Uh, not particularly for Japanese studies, but for um, the subjects that aren't quite, aren't, that aren't European or yep. uh, American kind of studies. Yeah, Peter? Uh, I think what we need in this country, what the US has had since 1958, which is a defense education, defense education program, uh, which is a program which declares that there are certain subjects uh, not necessarily languages, um, but languages are some of them, which are important for this country in order to maintain its relations, diplomatic, economic, and so forth, um, and that need to be preserved so that we have expertise constantly in these areas. Um, we have never had that in this country. We've had a succession of four government reports from 1908 up until 1985, each one of which has produced a small measure of funding of a limited duration and has then led to a resurgence of the problems. So I would like to see that act here. Okay, um, anybody else want to come in in the few minutes we have remaining? Yes, over, over there please. Can we have a microphone over to you, sir? There's a microphone on its way down to you. Thank you. Oh dear. Well, good evening. I hope you can all hear me. I was out in um, Japan immediately after the war. I'd been here at SOAS for 18 months studying Japanese, both written and oral. And when we got out there, of course, things were very, very different. But one of the main things I can remember, the ladies in Japanese, could talk quite clearly and understand what we were saying. The men, no. <laughs> going, going out uh, at Singapore, uh, there were about 300 Japanese prisoners of war come aboard. And of course, there were eight of us who'd uh, been studying here for 18 months. Uh, we thought, oh, excellent opportunities to get in touch. You know, in Japanese, we weren't allowed there at all. They were uh, right down you know, and they, we weren't permitted to go and talk with them at all. And uh, ultimately, when they got out, I do not know what happened, but there were very, very few Japanese men about, and none of them would talk to us. I was with the Americans out there, and um, we were doing, or mainly translating at first, reading the newspapers, you know, make a note of uh, anybody who's been murdered and so on and so forth. And then um, we went out to uh, Shikoku at um, Kure, I was. Um, this was with the Australians. And we went out uh, looking for, oh, things that were uh, s on the black market, really. Rice and... Um, uh, fish, anything like that, and of course, um, anything that uh, was harmful. But uh, once again, wherever we went, the men, they would not talk or wouldn't listen to us. Did you, did you feel frustrated by that? Did you feel... Oh, no, not at all. We, <laughs> <laughs> no. Provided the women would talk, you were happy. <laughs> no, well, quite often, uh, we'd go out, you know, in the backlands, there's about a or six foot road wide with a jeep, a left-handed jeep, by the way, and uh, 
It was right-handed there, but the tracks were only, say, six to eight feet wide. And on one occasion, I put it in all the notes I gave to you. Um, the uh, cart carrying the necessary materials caught with us. And, uh, you know, it's great hookum. Thank but, um, it, actually then, things were extremely difficult for the Japanese. And of course, the Americans didn't like them whatsoever, neither did the Australians, they'd all come up through the islands. But um, what it, I got back there oh, 15, 20 years ago, just for a week, totally different. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, your name, sir? Phillips. Phillips. Guy Phillips. Uh, Leslie, Leslie Phillips. Leslie Phillips. I've got a load of stuff that I gave you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there was a contribution here at the end of the row. Yes, sir. <coughs> Christopher Howe. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor here. I'd like first just to say one comment about Ron Dor that hasn't really been mentioned, and that is his phenomenal facility in the cha Japanese language. Uh, which something he certainly shares with Sir Hugh. I remember sitting in a hot hotel room in Tokyo in 1972 where I was being tutored in how to read 1930s Japanese. Mm. I switch on the television and Ron Dorr is giving an interview in Japanese on the, I think it was on demography. Absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> I mean, the fluency of the language was just absolutely incredible. And that was what it had enabled him to do things like his great study on the Japanese land reform, the city in Japan. These are fieldwork jobs, absolutely mm -hmm. terrific. And he combines fieldwork, language, and theory to a degree which is completely out of the ordinary. This is no typical uh, scholar of Japan. On your question of uh, economics, I'm, I'm an economist economic historian. And I worked on China for 20 years. I got fed up with working in China in the early 80s. And I had learnt Japanese for the study of pre-war China. And we started the Japanese program economics in 1980, 81, I think. And I was finally dropped from the teaching team last summer, <laughs> um, which is now in very good hands, I must say. I can tell you the struggle in economics is very difficult. One reason for this is the dominance of America. Yep. Yep. This is a, <laughs> economics is a field where the Americans are very important. If you wanted to look for the best people who have worked on either the Japanese or the Chinese economy in America, you wouldn't look in the economics departments. You would look at the Peterson Institute in Washington, yep international relations in Seattle, or the sociology department in Stanford. They're the best places, not economics departments. You're not employable as a regional specialist in most American economics departments. And that influence percolates to us. Uh, I'm in S2 of the British Academy, which is the economics and economic history. There are 80 people. There's nobody else who is a long-time trained specialist in any particular place, although there are two very outstanding people who have worked on India, mm. um, in Indian agriculture. But I can tell you that the conversations, the interests, it's very, very hard work. And this, I'm afraid, as has already been pointed out, is strongly reinforced by the research assessment. The research assessment gives the last word on all these things to the status quo, to the traditionalists. They have absolutely crucial, if you're recruiting people to do these jobs, by and large. So you can only really <coughs> find these subjects if they're in departments of area studies, international relations. You won't find them in the narrow disciplines. Okay. And that is a terrific. Thank you very much. I'll take one other contribution. Gentleman here. All oh, right, two, two. <laughs> gentleman here. Can we have a microphone to this gentleman here? And then a microphone to the lady in the, or oh, three. <laughs> I'll take three. So, uh, could you tell us uh, who you are, please? 
Uh, my name's Louis. I come from the other side of the water, having spent my time in studying China rather than Japan. But I started on the right side, attending one of the first courses in Japanese language delivered in this country. And I'm making this point simply for historical accuracy. We started in Bedford, attached to Bletchley Park, in February 1942. Much of what I've heard about the Dulwich boys has filled me with envy. We had one wonderful teacher to whom I would like to take the opportunity to pay absolute tribute. I'm talking of Captain Tuck of the Royal Navy, who, like all naval officers, when called to do a job, did it superbly without any training whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> The materials we had, there were three or four dictionaries of Japanese by Brinkley, 1872 or 80 perhaps, circulating in the room. And when you looked up a word such as sentoki, what did you find? Not a fighter aircraft, but the hair on a particular rib ribbon used in the Buddhist robes on festival <laughs> days. <laughs> There were also some two or three <coughs> copies of a pocket dictionary of, San of the, um, not San Cedo, I forget its name. They were there if you were lucky enough to get your hands on them. What did we have for training material in those days? <coughs> and the answer was the Romaji texts of the telegrams which had been sent by the Japanese news agencies, Yomiuri, Asahi and Mainichi, they, they shut up those offices and took their stack of telegrams, and there we had them. That is what we were trained on. No grammars, straight into it. Rizubon jo ho ni yoreba, off you went, what they were saying. <laughs> but uh, it was a wonderful course for six months. The Dulwich boys, I think, were rather luckier than we were. We were put straight into it after six months to work on Japanese military, naval, or air force, or diplomatic <coughs> codes and ciphers. The companions, I remember on that first class, you asked a question about what happened to those, uh, to the Dulwich boys. Well, we didn't do too badly. Uh, one of us became Regis Professor of Greek with a knighthood in Oxford. Another one became Regis Professor of Divinity again in Oxford. And several others took their part in other universities. Thank you for letting me just point out that Bletchley, <laughs> despite its secrecy, did its part. I did, I, did, I did give Bletchley a mention at the beginning, but yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll take two contributions, one from this lady down here and then the microphone two rows back. And that's it, I'm afraid. My name's Mavis Pilby. I did a Japanese degree here, 1974 to 1977. And um, I was lucky enough to do a, a contemporary literature course with Kenneth Strong, who had been in Japan um, immediately after the war with the Quakers. And um, talking about... <coughs> various aspects of Japan, politics, economics, and so on. But I, w I, would, um, I would mention literature as one of the best ways of getting into Japan, of understanding Japan. There's an a, um, event on at Daiwa tonight, which we're all missing about <laughs> Natsume Soseki. <laughs> um, and I would like to um, draw your attention to Steve Dodd's amazing course that's ours. <laughs> so, so go out and read a few novels. That's my, my advice. Okay. Can you hand the uh, microphone back? I'll do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Valerie Salmond, and my mother was, our mother was one of the Bletchley girls. And the seven members of the WAF came here in September 1943, and they did a six-month intensive course. So we've got photographs of them in their WAF uniform here. And we've got exam test papers, things like translate, there are 35 enemy bombers on the ground at position, <laughs> whatever. And we've got some 
test papers that she had. And um, she was helped. She had, as the um, Japanese ambassador mentioned, she had a classics degree. So maybe her Latin and Greek helped her. So after six months, um, the seven of them were then sent to Bletchley Park, where they worked on um, translating and coding. And talking about books, there we've got various Japanese dictionaries and one that she co-authored, uh, characters in service Japanese. So that was obviously that they had to put together. And mentioned, Soas is mentioned in this book, the Debs of Bletchley Park, and there's <laughs> that's in that as well. So I just thought I'd tell you about the Bletchley Park um, girls as well. Thank, thank you very much, and um, uh, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies if I have left out Bletchley Park, but <coughs> my Bible on all of this is a fascinating book called The Japanese War, which is a history of Japanese teaching in here at SOAS, written in uh, about 1988, I think, by Sadao Oba, and translated in the early 90s by Anne Kaneko, and it's actually a rather good read. Um, my thank you to you for your contributions from the audience. My thank you to all our panellists, Ron Dorr with his son Julian there, acting as a, a human megaphone, uh, <laughs> Hugh Cortazzi, Martin Hatful, Caroline Bennett, Branwyn Darlington, and Laura Hine. I'm now going to hand over for a very, very few words to Richard Black of SOAS, Pro-Director of SOAS, for a few closing remarks. So the floor is yours. So I will be really brief, as I realize I'm now between you and wine. <laughs> so I just want to also thank our panelists and also thank Nick for such a, doing such a wonderful job chairing this evening's event. We really appreciate it, Nick. And can I also, while I'm on thanks, thank Jane and all of the events and alumni and development team who've helped organize this. Uh, a, a round of applause for them, please. <laughs> We've heard this evening about various facets of Japanese studies at SOAS, obviously about the language, which is where it all started, or indeed maybe it didn't, but also the literature, the economics, management, history, and perhaps also some of the gaps. I, I think we do not teach uh, Japanese food, but maybe we should. Um, we're very proud here at SOAS of our track record over a century now of attracting the most gifted students from around the world and enabling those students to fulfill their remarkable potential. And as we look ahead in our centenary celebrations and our next 100 years, we wish to continue uh, our legacy of inspiring students to study Japan, Japan Japanese studies uh, in its widest sense, and to foster an ever greater understanding of Japan, uh, its language, culture, history, politics, literature, and so on. Um, our goal, or one of our goals in this, is to establish a range of scholarships and grants at all levels dedicated specifically to the study of Japan. <laughs> An engaged alumni is critical to achieving this goal. Alumni can give back to SOAS in so many ways. Um, we've had some of the contributions tonight in terms of recollections and time. Uh, also alumni help us with mentoring, with offering internships and work experience, making introductions, and of course, in some cases, giving financial support. Over a thousand alumni, indeed, have already donated to our recent fundraising appeal, as have many SOAS staff, and I'd like to extend a great thank you to all of you who've contributed so far in relation to our centenary. But whether finance or time or in terms of networks, if you are interested in becoming part of the future of Japanese studies uh, at SOAS, please do talk to me or any of my colleagues after this event, um, and we, let's see where we can take this conversation in the future. So finally, thank you all of you for joining us here, including our friends from Dulwich College. I'm not quite sure where you are in the audience, but thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Um, and, and please do join us now for a glass of wine in the reception outside the lecture theatre. Just one more thing I've been asked to do. We think it would be a great idea if those of you who've studied Japanese here at SOAS would like to come down to the front and we will take a picture of our Japanese alums and perhaps also uh, families if you are here uh, before, we, uh, before we depart for drinks. But otherwise, thank you. Thank you all for coming and thank you. Thank you.